chapter thirty one of the life and adventures of michael armstrong the factory boy this is a librivox recording chapter thirty one a friendly consultation a dangerous embassy lady clarissa receives some disagreeable intelligence an awkward contest unpleasant visions a fitting termination to the confidential union between master and man such was the state of affairs in the bedroom of sir matthew dowling when dr crockley entered it were all the words which mrs gabberly then uttered in explanation of what she had done why she had done it and how her doings had answered to be written down here my waning pages would hardly suffice to contain them dr crockley nodded winked approved and applauded a great deal joked a little and finally felt the patient's pulse observing at the same time that it was necessary at any rate to bring him round sufficiently to get a little talk on business out of him before he popped off for good and all very right and proper if you can manage it doctor sagaciously observed mrs gabberly but you may depend upon it that and here she whispered something that it was especially intended martha should be neither the better nor the worse for the doctor nodded and winked and nodded again and then turning to the poor girl who was not only the one who alone in that presence cared anything for the prostrate millocrat but the one of all created beings who would alone have felt his death to be a cause of mourning dr crockley turned to her and with very little of even the external decency of sympathy said do you think you can manage to get some mustard my dear out of the clutches of the bailiffs because that is what we want here without answering martha moved towards the door and michael not conceiving that the physician's words were but a brutal jest and fancying that martha might really have to petition those who now held authority in the household for the article wanted stepped after her to request that he might execute the commission in her place you shall come down with me michael she replied and i doubt not you will be able to procure what we want without difficulty but alas michael it will avail nothing i am sure by their whispering that they both know it will avail nothing nevertheless it shall be tried but is it not dreadful that of all his numerous family there should be only one to receive his dying breath oh god she added with clasped hands and streaming eyes if it be a judgment let it atone for all that has been wrong for surely it is a heavy one on reaching the hall the pitying michael who in the sufferings of his friend forgot all the cruelty of his enemy insisted upon going alone in the thronged and noisy offices while she sat down to wait for his return he did his errand promptly and was by her side again in a minute or two but he found that she had left the chair on which he had placed her and was now pacing up and down the hall in violent agitation i am overpowered i am borne down by all this horror this deep and bitter grief she exclaimed and there is not a single human being near me but your ill-used self michael from whom i am likely to find any real kindness the conduct of all with whom i have had intercourse since my poor father's distresses came upon him has been such as to make me wish rather to shun than seek them at this awful moment yet i want some one to tell me how i ought to act i know that fearful man parsons who is greatly in his confidence had business of importance to settle with him for again and again my father has said to me since the execution has been in the house that let what would happen he must find time to speak to him ought i not then to send to him in this extremity would to heaven i were fitter to advise you my dear miss martha replied michael with equal respect and tenderness certainly if such were your father's words it is very right to remember them shall i go to the factory and summon mr parsons hither oh it is hateful to me replied poor martha to call such a being to his deathbed but it may be that the interests of others are at stake and when i recall my father's earnestness as he spoke of the necessity of seeing him i tremble at the idea of disobeying him go then michael hasten to the factory and tell this man that his master is very ill but that if he recovers his senses and his speech it is probable he may wish to speak to him michael lost no time in obeying her and on reaching the mills found the superintendent as usual at his post at the first glance he did not recognize the messenger for the appearance of the young man was greatly changed by the style of equipment which under the advice of mr bell had been provided for him no sooner did michael speak however than the man started as if he had been shot sir matthew send you he exclaimed what mountbank tricks are you got at now you young villain what did you think that this fine toggery could bamboozle me has it really bamboozled him 
have you faith and troth contrived to pass yourself off upon your dearly beloved benefactor as a gentleman of fashion and fortune who has come to make him a visit of condolence upon his misfortunes a capital fellow ain't you or perhaps my nice young grandee you fancy his grinders are drawn and that he can't or won't maybe have anything to do now that he has fallen into trouble with putting such an elegant young gentleman to inconvenience is that it but it is just possible that other people may be more at leisure who knows never mind me now mr parsons replied michael utterly indifferent at that moment to anything and everything that his old enemy might attempt for the purpose of annoying him never think of me or my affairs at such a time as this you have given me no opportunity to speak for you would have understood that it was not sir matthew who sent me here but his daughter sir matthew was too ill when i left the house to know anything about it but miss martha thinks that if he recovers his speech and senses he may wish to speak to you like enough replied the superintendent with a sneer sir matthew's troubles have nowise changed his nature the young lady is quite right but i shouldn't have thought that he'd have told her anything about it either no but what she might approve the job too if she had got any spirit in her but she is but a poor puling sort of a creature much as she was when she used to cost at you my beautiful master runaway apprentice however never mind that now and as you say my pretty master there's a time for all things you may just step in here while i change my coat it beant the first time as you have entered this pleasant building master mike is it michael was going to obey him but at the moment he was about to pass the threshold something in the eye of the superintendent made him pause he recollected full well the ready lock of that once hated door and it struck him as by no means impossible that his old acquaintance might turn it upon him if he put it in his power to do so fears for his own personal safety he certainly had none being quite aware that he was no longer in any danger of being kidnapped as heretofore but the idea of martha being left at this her utmost need in want of any little service he could afford was quite enough to make him cautious and with something of an involuntary smile he stepped back saying there is no occasion for me to wait for you mr parsons i have delivered my message and you may obey it or not as you please at any rate you cannot want me to show you the way to dowling lodge and so saying he turned round and walked out of the yard pestilent young viper muttered the superintendent between his closed teeth that i should live to see him strut off before me in that fashion but i'll have a try if i can't plague him yet fool that i was when i had him snug by myself on ridgetop moor not to give him one farewell thrashing with the horsewhip if i had put out a joint or two it would have been no great matter and then i should have been spared the d blank sight of him now marching off blank hang him like a peacock before me as to changing my coat that's fudge people don't trouble themselves to change their coats when they are going to pay their compliments to an apoplectic bankrupt having fairly got beyond all the bolts and bars immediately within the jurisdiction of mr parsons michael slackened his pace being rather inclined to have the society of his former tyrant than not sir matthew appears to be in a very dangerous state mr parsons said he as soon as the sulky superintendent came up to him perhaps your right honourable greatness has been studying medicine since i had the pleasure of taking that little drive with you into derbyshire i have studied many things since that time mr parsons replied michael laughing and one is the nature and use of locks the tone in which this was answered was so brutal that the young man rather from disgust than anger walked on faster than his foe could follow him and reaching the house some minutes before him made his way again without ceremony for it was no time for it into the apartment of sir matthew a considerable change had taken place in the condition of the patient since he left it the cataplasms had so far succeeded as to restore animation and consciousness sir matthew still surrounded by martha mrs gabberly and the doctor was gazing upon them with widely opened eyes which though wild and wandering in expression were evidently not devoid of speculation michael had entered very gently but not without being heard by the sick man for he turned his eyes full upon him as he approached the sight of him however no longer seemed to produce any emotion for after looking quietly at him for a moment sir matthew turned his gaze upon mrs gabberly who from being in the act of leaning over him brought herself particularly within his sight is parsons come said martha in a whisper he must be in the hall by this time replied michael shall i tell him to come up my dear father has not yet spoken she said 
but perhaps he may understand me parsons is here papa she added taking her father's hand and leaning over him should you like to see him he is in london my dear replied the knight very distinctly thank god exclaimed martha tenderly kissing him thank god his speech is not in the least affected rather wandering though said dr crockley winking his eye at mrs gabberly i should say bleed him again if you want to get anything out of him observed mrs gabberly looking sagaciously at the doctor perhaps i may in an hour or two he replied applying his finger to the patient's pulse sir matthew fixed his eyes upon him and laughed a horrid rattling ghastly sort of laugh that seemed to come from his throat you haven't quite done with me yet have you crockley said he done with you my dear friend god forbid replied the physician rather startled at the apparently healthy state of his patient's intellect and affectionately smoothing his pillows and settling the bedclothes about him would you like to see parsons dear papa said martha gently and again bending over him oh yes he replied eagerly i'll see parsons now directly i should be very sorry not to see parsons i may live or i may die you know but i must see parsons martha immediately left the room intending to explain to the superintendent before she brought him into it the state in which her father lay and the necessity of receiving any orders he might wish to give with as little disturbance to him as possible on reaching the hall however she saw him not and was on the point of returning upstairs to inquire of michael where he had left him when she caught the sound of his voice from sir matthew's study on entering this room she perceived not only mr parsons but lady clarissa who standing before the commode in which as she happened to know her husband was accustomed to keep papers of importance as well as money appeared to have been very assiduously examining its contents for every recess had evidently been visited and as one of her hands was tightly clutched over a pocket-book it seemed that her researches had not been wholly in vain and that she had not privately obtained possession of his keys for nothing i was sent for my lady said parsons apparently replying to some question of her ladyship's which to judge by her angry frown and the vexed expression of her countenance had not been a civil one my father wishes to see mr parsons directly said martha and by your ladyship's leave i must take that green pocket-book with me said parsons what pocket-book you rude fellow replied clarissa indignantly that one as your ladyship now holds in your left hand replied the confidential superintendent i wonder sirrah that you do not ask me to give you the rings off my fingers cried the angry mistress of the mansion go to your master fellow if he has sent for you and i shall go too so you need not trouble yourself about the pocket-book and with these words she pushed past both martha and mr parsons preceding them to the sick man's chamber by the time they entered it his eyes were again closed but he appeared to breathe without difficulty though rather more audibly than usual and martha fancied that he was asleep hush said she do not disturb him he is sleeping dr crockley and mrs gabberly had withdrawn to a window and were evidently in consultation but whether on the symptoms of apoplexy or bankruptcy might be doubtful michael however was standing close beside the bed and in answer to martha's observation shook his head saying no not asleep then he'll manage to hear what i've got to say to him said parsons advancing and throwing a glance of spiteful vengeance at lady clarissa because it is just what he wants to know at the sound of parsons voice sir matthew opened his eyes and made an effort to raise himself but this was beyond his power and it was only by being lifted with as little effort as possible on his own part as if he were already dead that he was placed in the attitude he seemed to desire and in which he was supported by pillows and by the arms of poor martha who had placed herself on the bolster behind him it was a frightful and awful expression which then took possession of his sunken features nevertheless a hateful sort of smile made part of it parsons that's you isn't it that's parsons that stands there he said directing his misty eyes full upon the superintendent yes sir matthew tis me replied the man have you done my bidding parsons demanded the knight with a sort of gasping which seemed to threaten that his breath was about to leave him yes sir matthew it's all regularly made out replied parsons nobody can mistake now about times or dates in any way and isn't that the honourable lady clarissa said the sick man directing his eyes towards her yes sir matthew replied parsons with something like a titter 
then 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 panted the dying man let her ladyship know what was the last business that i gave you instructions about a very fitting business for an honourable gentleman to attend to when his affairs are in confusion and he not in an over-good state of health replied the confidential servant turning himself round so as exactly to face her ladyship no less a matter than restoring three good thousand pounds a year for ever towards clearing scores with his creditors now three thousand pounds a year was exactly the sum for the settlement of which upon herself a daughter of the noble house of highlandlock had condescended to assume the name of dowling and the mention of the often meditated sum roused her ladyship's attention so effectually that her face involuntarily protruded itself beyond her body till her nose very nearly reached that of the individual who was addressing her go on said sir matthew positively chuckling though his chin dropped on his chest as he spoke well then resumed parsons leering aside at dr crockley who with mrs gabberly had drawn near to listen to this very interesting disclosure well then justice is justice and sir matthew let him die when he will won't have it upon his conscience that he defrauded his creditors to make a settlement upon any lady in the land gentle or simple because you see he has left proof plain and clear that he had committed more than one act of bankruptcy before he made the settlement upon her ladyship and for that good and excellent reason her ladyship will have no right to one single penny that he leaves behind him and that is a comfort to an honest man like me who likes to see justice done to high and low villain screamed lady clarissa it is false no 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 issued from the pillows in a voice that shook with ghastly laughter true all true and now she may go to scotland just ask her to give you your green pocket-book sir matthew before she goes said parsons grinning i saw her ladyship take it out of your bureau and if she will be pleased to open her hand i think it will tumble out of it with a look of inexpressible rage lady clarissa turned away from him and made towards the door stop her crockley cried sir matthew feebly adding with panting difficulty and you shall have it dr crockley had a great respect for the peerage and would beyond all question have preferred snatching a pocket-book from nine hundred and ninety-nine untitled ladies in succession rather than from one lady clarissa but he felt that this was no moment for ceremony and obeying what was very likely to be the last behest of his patron he rolled his fat person after her with extraordinary muscular exertion and grasping the lady's robe with one hand seized on her rigidly clenched fist with the other in such a sort that according to the prophecy of mr parsons the green pocket-book dropped out of it unfortunately however the attitude in which this feat was performed was one which could not be retained by the ill-balanced person of the doctor after the supporting form of the lady on whom he had thrown himself had escaped from his grasp and struggling with as much anxious care as caesar to fall well i e upon the pocket-book he measured his length upon the ground parsons though certainly not hoping for so lucky an accident had with the same sort of instinct which brings the crow beside a sickly sheep followed closely the retreating steps of her ladyship and adroitly jerking the coveted pocket-book with his foot so that it should escape the being buried under the stumbling physician prepared himself to dip and catch it but the success of the manoeuvre was less perfect than its ingenuity deserved for ere his tall rigid person had bent itself sufficiently for him to reach the ground mrs gabberly who had become one of the group at the same instant with dr crockley was in possession of it and ere the prostrate crockley or the stooping parsons could raise their eyes the prize had dropped into the deepest recesses of a prodigious pocket which reached nearly to the bottom of her little petticoat it is probable that both inquiry and search might have been instituted in consequence of this had not the condition of the patient at that moment rendered it impossible sir matthew's ghastly eyes had fixed themselves on lady clarissa during the foregoing scene but as if though they had still the power of discerning objects they had lost that of moving after them he appeared to lose sight of her as she approached the door and the heavy orbs seemed seeking for something on which to rest themselves without any change of position it chanced that michael who quite aware that the last moments of sir matthew were approaching determined not to leave the premises till he had learned the wishes and intentions of martha was at the moment moving from the corner he had occupied near a window not within sight of the bed to a table exactly at the foot of it on which was placed a flacon of cologne water which poor martha almost exhausted by the painful attitude necessary to sustain the pillows had made him a sign to get for her 
this movement brought him within the range of sir matthew's eyes and something in his aspect as he cautiously bent to take the bottle or else the thick coming fancies of a brain diseased though not paralysed suddenly produced a terrible effect upon the dying man and he uttered a cry so harsh and terrible as to constrain the attention even of the preoccupied group at the door there's a dead body walking about the room he ejaculated in an unnatural and frightful accent he is come for me and i must go the shriek which followed these words was terrible in a minute or two he spoke again but almost in a whisper one no it is not one it is five hundred take them take them away from me i tell you they are all dirty beastly factory children their arms and legs are all broken and smashed and hanging by bits of skin take them away i tell you crockley their horrid joints will drop upon me they are dangling and loose i tell you and then again he shouted with so fearful a cry that even parsons pressed his hands upon his ears to save them from the sound calm him calm him cried the trembling martha can you not give him something that may still this dreadful agony dr crockley it is not a very easy symptom to master miss martha replied the physician dryly however it is not likely that it will last long all the life that's left is just about the heart and brain which is always unlucky if there happens to be anything particular upon the mind parsons cried the dying man again raising his voice but without looking towards the person he addressed parsons are you not ashamed of yourself to turn the whole set of them out upon me at once in this way you that have paid and bribed and tipped so often rascal take them off me i tell you do you mean that they shall stifle me they will stifle me they will they will i cannot breathe for them parsons i tell you they will stifle me papa my dear dear papa cried martha bending forward till her cheek touched that of her father compose yourself it is only that you are unwell and fancy things there are no children here papa but your own martha her tender caresses and her gentle voice together seemed to reach and quiet for a moment his wandering intellect he made an effort to turn his head towards her but that was impossible and michael who had upon his first frightful cry removed himself to the head of the bed where the eye of the wretched man could not reach silently offered to take martha's place that she might station herself where it could she quickly understood him and in a moment stood where that dying eye could gaze upon her his hand with its glittering ring still lay upon the bed she took it in hers and fondly chafed and kissed it but it was stiff and cold as marble father dearest father she said speak one word to me but it was too late his lips never opened more for some hours longer he continued to breathe but on again feeling his pulse dr crockley declared that its faint pulsations must inevitably cease before night i suppose your old servant betty parker is still in the house miss martha said he the poor girl bowed an affirmative but had no power to speak well then said the doctor i should recommend that you should put her to sit here it is no good for any of us to stay any longer for it's all over just as much as if he was already in his coffin you had better go away and see what you can pack up to get off with miss martha that's all that is left to be done as far as i can see come mrs gabberly he added i have got a friendly word or two to say to you so your boy shall mount my pony and i'll drive your donkey for you and so saying he took the little woman under his arm and trudged off without waiting for her to inform him whether she approved his proposal or not mr parsons giving one scowling look at the silent bed followed them and martha and michael were left together beside the dying man upon perceiving the totally unconscious state into which sir matthew had fallen michael had gently withdrawn himself from behind his pillows and now stood almost as silent and motionless as himself beside the bed respectfully waiting to receive from the desolate and weeping martha some hint or instruction respecting his staying where he was or leaving her never when the poor dependent of her family had the young heart of michael been impressed with a feeling of respect so profound as he had at the moment felt for the unhappy girl in truth the feeling was so powerful as to interfere with his usefulness for he shrank from appearing to put himself forward too presumptuously by giving her advice 
or venturing in any degree to dictate what it might be best for her to do but when after remaining thus bashfully silent for a quarter of an hour he perceived that she gave no other sign of life than by tears that flowed incessantly and sighs that seemed to heave her breast almost to bursting when he saw this he began to think that some degree of seeming presumption on his part might be better and more profitable for her whom he would really have died to serve than the continuance of a degree of deference which must render him useless approaching therefore to the chair on which she had thrown herself he ventured to say miss martha where can i find your old servant betty parker i remember her very well she used to be always in the nursery if you would tell me where she is likely to be i will go for her poor martha for a moment ceased to weep and looked up at him michael armstrong she replied i am not conscious of ever having injured any human being but yourself and yet you are the only one who is near to support and help me at this dreadful hour god bless you for your kindness my good boy do not go away michael that is i mean do not leave the house till all is over indeed i think you may be useful to me miss martha he returned will you trust me to sit here while you yourself summon whomever you may wish to keep you company i will keep out of sight in case and here he stopped his eyes will never open more michael she replied while the tears again burst forth and thank god their last look at me was gentle but i almost fear to leave the room michael i would not that he should breathe his last and i not by him but michael unskilful as he was felt that the scene was too awful a one for the poor girl to be left alone in and he therefore persisted to declare with the authority which such subduing sorrow gives to all around who will take the trouble to exercise it that he would watch by the bedside of her father while she sought the old woman mentioned by dr crockley reluctantly and unresistingly she consented and giving a look at the bed that seemed to wring her very heart she quitted the room leaving michael armstrong alone with the motionless mass of still living clay before which he had so often trembled how strangely eventful had been the interval between those well-remembered days and the one actually present with him how extraordinary the change in the circumstances of both parties it was not triumph but it was thankfulness which michael felt as the sense of this came fully upon him during these moments of profound stillness and the result of all the moving thoughts that crowded upon his mind was an earnest prayer to heaven that he might never be placed in any circumstances likely to harden his heart and make him the cause of suffering to others a fearful and a dreadful crime which he felt as he gazed with trembling awe on the sunken features of the living corpse before him must in the sight of god be held as one of the most daring rebellion to his heavenly will of which man is capable solemn and solitary as was michael's position in the chamber of sir matthew the interval of martha's absence did not seem long she returned accompanied by the old servant who had been nursery attendant though never raised to the dignity of nurse from the birth of the eldest child of the family and who was the only one remaining of all the numerous household who retained the slightest feeling of attachment to any of them to her habit stood in the place of preference and she might perhaps be said to love all the dowling children from the eldest to the youngest a sentiment which led her to conceive as in duty bound a most hearty detestation of their stepmother it was therefore with something very like pleasure that she obeyed a summons so solemn and so peremptory as to justify her even in the judgment of mrs saunderson for laying aside the ironing box which she had been plying incessantly for two whole days upon the frills and furbelows of lady clarissa in order to obey it on perceiving the condition in which her master lay betty parker strongly advised poor martha to retire urging the uselessness of her remaining to look upon what was so grievous when a baby might see at half a glance that the poor gentleman could not tell friend from foe but betty parker knew little of the intensity of martha's pertinacious love for her unworthy parent if she fancied that her very reasonable remonstrance would produce any effect martha attempted not even to answer it but placing herself in a chair close beside the bed remained nearly as motionless as the faintly breathing figure that lay upon it poor michael knew not too well what he ought to do next he felt that he was useless there he knew that he should be stared at as a very incomprehensible intruder if he descended to the offices yet he remembered that his benefactress had bid him not to go and he could not have felt himself more strongly bound to remain had the crime of high treason been involved in his departure yet there was something in the stupid puzzled look with which betty parker regarded him that vexed his spirit he was conscious that he had no business in that room and therefore at such a moment he ought not to be there 
after a few moments of reflection he approached martha and making so profound a reverence as to convince betty that let him be who he would he was a very well-behaved young gentleman he said i will now miss martha go to the inn for an hour or two and then return to take your orders a look of gratitude was all her reply and michael departed it was three o'clock in the afternoon when he entered the little inn where the postboy who had driven him from fairly in the morning was still waiting his orders i cannot tell you yet my lad when i shall be ready to return he replied in answer to the boy's questionings it's all one to me master said the driver in course i shall be paid accordingly certainly you will returned michael and he was then left to eat his solitary dinner with what appetite he might for three long melancholy hours he employed himself in pacing backwards and forwards on the high road before the little inn and was beginning to think that time enough had elapsed to justify his returning to inquire how matters were going on at dowling lodge when the sound of a carriage approaching as it seemed from the park gates caused him to stop abruptly to listen and to look the equipage that drew near was a handsome travelling carriage though its appearance was considerably disfigured by the prodigious quantity of luggage which was fastened by ropes and chains to every part of it the imperial only formed the foundation for a pyramid of trunks and bandboxes which were piled upon it the servant's seat behind was loaded to its very utmost capacity with more trunks and bandboxes while chained below it was a massive coffer that looked very like a plate chest having suspended round its sides bundles baskets and bags innumerable nor was the interior by any means reserved for live lumber alone for although the rigid figures of lady clarissa dowling and her waiting-woman saunderson were visible in the midst it appeared to be crammed with every imaginable species of property which such a conveyance could transport michael watched the overloaded vehicle roll by with great satisfaction whatever happens thought he miss martha must be better without her relieved by knowing that he should not again run the risk of encountering her delectable ladyship michael immediately took his way to the magnificent mansion she had forsaken and perceiving that the hall doors stood wide open preferred passing through them to encountering again the motley throng that had taken possession of the offices but instead of finding this portion of the house as quiet and forsaken as he had left it he was startled by hearing as he mounted the steps of the stately portico a multitude of voices in violent altercation at first he felt disposed to turn away and seek another entrance but the vehemence of the sounds he heard excited his curiosity and he went on instead of one half a dozen strangers might have entered without running any risk of having their right there challenged so great was the confusion that reigned and michael might have passed up the great stairs and into the chamber which it was his purpose to visit without any difficulty but he was prevented from taking immediate advantage of this by hearing words which excited new fears for the unfortunate martha and ere he had listened many minutes he became aware that a new creditor had reached the lodge after he left it who had come armed with proper authority to arrest the knight dead or alive nor did the discussion of this event cause all the uproar for the agents of the parties who had previously sent in the execution were threatening with all sorts of punishment several of the servants whom they accused of having been bribed to assist lady clarissa in the removal of many valuables which she had no right to take it was not this part of the tumult however that interested him and having obtained but too clearly the information that sir matthew was arrested he once more sought for the unhappy martha in the dismal chamber where he had left her and there he found her but with such frightful adjuncts to her natural grief that the state of quiet decent sorrow in which he had left her seemed a condition positively enviable compared to that in which she found her now sir matthew had breathed his last and the corpse was already arranged with decency upon its stately bed but on each side of it stood an officer whose duty it was to violate by their presence the solemn sanctity of that dismal chamber and to prevent the bodies being carried to the grave till the claims of their employer were satisfied in front of her father's corpse with her troubled eyes no longer bathed in the healing dew of natural sorrow turning from it to its rude guardians and back again to all that was left of the sinful being she had so fondly blindly loved stood the wretched daughter so sad a spectacle of woe that it was evident the men themselves turned their hard eyes studiously away because they felt a pang of pity as they looked upon her come with me miss martha cried michael unceremoniously seizing her arm you must not you cannot remain here you can do no good miss martha all is over now 
you must come away you must indeed the only answer that poor martha gave was forcibly shaking off the hand that held her and then pointing first to her father's body and afterwards to the two unseemingly attendants who stood beside it it is no use young man to strive with her said betty who was still occupied in completing some of her lugubrious operations about the bed i know her better than you do she will stay here watching him till she is as dead as he is rather than go away and leave his body to be tended by such as those for a moment michael really felt all the enervating effects of despair and stood perfectly incapable of even imagining any means of help for the agony which it wrung his heart to witness but as the old woman pursued her ghastly occupation she went muttering on expatiating on the sinful and unchristian outrage that was thus committed and what will the rogue get by it she said does he mean to show the corpse for a farthing a head to his factory blackguards isn't he as big a fool as he is knave no mistress no by no means said the friendly defender of mr joseph parsons for it was at his suit that the body of sir matthew had been arrested you may call the superintendent rogue or knave or what you will of that kind and i don't suppose that there's many as would contradict you but as to his being a fool especially as to the doing what he has done here that he is not twas his only chance and how much do you think he'll make of it demanded old betty with a sneer why just the four hundred and sixty-seven pounds as is due to him replied the man to all this poor martha appeared not to pay the slightest attention and in truth neither understood nor heard a word of it but michael did and with sudden animation stepped up to the man who had spoken and whispered in his ear perhaps we may be able to settle this business without any further difficulty step out of the room with me will you for a moment your companion can do all that is necessary without you neither i nor my employer are people to make difficulties replied the man and i am quite ready to hear you young master if you have got anything to say upon the subject they accordingly retired together and in a wondrously short space of time the uninitiated michael was made to understand all the circumstances of the case the most important of which was that if as mr parsons hoped and expected miss martha could find ready money enough quietly to pay his little private account with the late sir matthew the arrest would be immediately withdrawn and the body left for her to dispose of it at her pleasure and the sum said michael is how much four hundred and sixty-seven pounds replied the man with some little matter not exceeding four or five pounds more for cost withdraw the arrest said michael and the money shall be instantly forthcoming let us see the money forthcoming replied the fellow grinning and the arrest shall be instantly withdrawn here is the money sir said michael taking out the pocket-book containing martha's generous donation and drawing from it notes to the amount demanded then the business will be soon settled young gentleman may i take the liberty to ask your name my name is of no consequence whatever sir replied michael but lose no time in giving me the discharge only first enter that chamber with me once again withdraw your companion from his frightful watch and tell the poor young lady that it is over the man readily obeyed and the morning but thankful martha was once more left with her old servant to watch beside her father's corpse End of chapter thirty one chapter thirty two of the life and adventures of michael armstrong this is a librivox recording chapter thirty two mr augustus dowling gives his sister martha notice to quit the premises which occasions michael to appear in a new character a long journey taken by novices but they do not lose their way and arrive at the right place at last the circumstances which immediately followed are not of sufficient consequence to detain us long our old acquaintance mr augustus now major dowling of the blank regiment quartered at the distance of a day's journey was sent for to get through the melancholy business going on in his paternal mansion as well as he could to give orders respecting the funeral and to make himself as thoroughly acquainted with the real state of his family's affairs as circumstances would permit michael meanwhile had taken leave of the weeping martha without having given her the slightest hint as to the means by which sir matthew's body had been released had he not known that the mr augustus whose kicks and pinches he so well remembered was expected to arrive for the protection of his sister and of whatever property they might still call their own he would hardly have made up his mind to leave her 
however conscious he might have been of the doubtful propriety of offering such protection as he could give but it was evident that the poor girl thought he had better go though it was equally so that she parted from him with the greatest reluctance you shall hear from me she said my good michael and if it should never be my good fortune to see you more remember me with the same forgiving kindness that you have shown through all the dreadful scenes you have witnessed here you have a good and generous heart michael and though i know you suffered much by being present at them you will always like to remember how greatly your presence helped to support your early friend in her great affliction but it was not destined that these sad scenes should be the last in which michael and his early friend were to be thrown together in little more than a week after the death of sir matthew and while michael was still anxiously waiting at fairly for such tidings from her as might put him at liberty to set off without further delay for nice a packet reached him from dowling lodge containing two letters one was from martha and contained these words dear michael my brother tells me that all of us who are old enough must seek our own living for there is nothing left to support us myself especially he says must to use his own words look about me directly as my behaviour to my family has never been such as to justify my looking to any of them for assistance this amounts to my being actually turned out of doors an exigency which at this moment leaves me no other resource than what is afforded by the enclosed letter read it michael and let me know if you are willing to give me your assistance and protection in reaching the amiable writer of it i could never have accepted even for a day the hospitality she so generously offers could i not prove to her by bringing you with me that the sad subject which interrupted our friendship some seven or eight years ago could never again be a source of pain to either of us my dear father's last act towards me which was as i think i told you the placing a few hundred pounds in my hands for the express purpose of my leaving the country will enable me to undertake this long journey without being a burden upon you the green pocket-book michael so well known to mr parsons and lady clarissa as the repository of my father's ready money and so disgracefully struggled for during his last moments will prove of no value to its possessors beyond its morocco cover and its silken lining for the notes which he took from it to give me were the last he ever placed in it my messenger has orders to wait for your reply if it will suit you immediately to accompany me to nice my first stage shall be to the little inn at fairly which you mentioned to me i fear you will find me a weak and troublesome traveller but i think i have been improving in health ever since i learnt that i had not your death to answer for your grateful friend martha dowling the other letter was for miss brotherton and ran thus need i tell you my dearest martha with what feelings i received the news of your present painful position your father's marriage with lady clarissa was for your sake a source of great sorrow to me for i was certain that your domestic happiness would be destroyed by it and this most unexpected event of your father's bankruptcy makes me feel quite sure that you have no longer a comfortable home in england come then to me my dear martha the painful estrangement which grew between us just when i was beginning to know and value your excellent qualities has long been a source of very painful regret to me because i am aware that i judged you unfairly and pronounced that judgment harshly be generous then and prove that you can forgive this by immediately giving me the pleasure of receiving you as my guest when we are together we will consult about what will be best for the future but at any rate i have the satisfaction of knowing that the climate to which i am inviting you is likely to be beneficial to your health during the approaching winter come to me then dear friend without delay on the other side you will find the route sketch that i recommend for your journey my quarters are roomy enough to accommodate either man or maid-servant or both if it will suit you to be so accompanied ever my dear martha affectionately yours mary brotherton the consequence of this packet was another metamorphosis on the part of michael she shall not think said he addressing mr bell that my respect for her is lessened because her fortune has fallen i will wait upon her with faithful duty and most grateful affection but she was born in a palace and i in a cabin and i will not especially just now obtrude myself upon her as a companion as her servant i hope i may be useful to her and it is in that capacity that i shall attend her there was so much good feeling shown in this project that mr bell could not oppose it whatever he might think of its necessity and michael therefore gave the astonished martha the meeting at the little inn she had named in the character of a very neat and respectable-looking man-servant her faithful betty parker who had consented to be the companion of her journey was in the room with her when michael made his appearance at the door to receive her orders 
the cautious manner in which he made her comprehend his purpose and the nature of the office he had assumed suggested to her the propriety of not discussing it in the presence of the well-contented betty who was exceedingly comforted by discovering that the young man whom her mistress had informed her would travel with them was to do so as her fellow-servant as she by no means felt herself capable of becoming servant of all work to a young lady travelling through foreign countries of which she had never even heard the names but having contrived to dismiss her female attendant on an errand martha began to remonstrate with her faithful squire upon the great mistake he had made in fancying that she had ever thought of travelling with him in any other capacity than that of a friend all she said however was in vain michael though in a manner the most humbly respectful persisted in his purpose and the almost destitute girl was therefore constrained to set off upon her travels in a style which she felt to be very unfitting to her situation her conscience however could not reproach her for this for most assuredly she could not help it many were the letters and various the mementos of affection entrusted by mr and mrs bell to the care of michael for their dearly beloved mary brotherton nor was there an individual of whose welfare he thought it would please her to hear whom he did not visit to receive their loving blessings for the benefactress who notwithstanding her wide wanderings had never failed to remember the wants of all who had faithfully served her or in any way become dependent on her bounty these duties completed and a farewell of most grateful affection uttered to the amiable clergyman and his excellent wife michael set off upon his long journey with feelings of hope joy confidence fear diffidence and trembling affection all so strongly mixed together in his bosom that had his life depended on it he could not himself have told which it was that most frequently preponderated yet altogether his state of mind was very delightful the novelty and excitement of journeying so pregnant of enjoyment to most of us was most especially captivating to him whose education had been little more than the unchecked development of imagination and of that keen observation of all surrounding objects which his shepherd life had taught him the first painful interruption to the state of felicity arose from his finding himself under the necessity of confessing to martha that he had no more money wherewith to pay their way aware that in the performance of his self-appointed office michael would have to pay everything and keep a regular account of it and aware also that the money he had received from her would enable him to do this without giving him the additional trouble of daily settlements with her she had merely said a minute or two before they set off you will be kind enough to be my banker michael during the journey and we will settle accounts at the end of it for just one week from the day of their leaving fairly he was able to do this but then the little remnant of his treasure failed him and great as was his repugnance to the measure he was compelled by dire necessity to confess that nearly the whole of her generous gift had gone to to satisfy the rapacity of mr parsons it would be hardly possible for one human being to be more grateful to another than poor martha felt to her young attendant after this disclosure she remembered the agony which he had made to cease she remembered too her state of utter incapacity even to comprehend and still less to avert the horrors that surrounded her and spite of all michael's respectful efforts to induce her to perform her allotted character properly she never from the hour of this disclosure treated him otherwise than as a dear and a valued friend as their journey approached its termination however to which period michael had looked with peculiar anxiety as that most important to the dignity of martha there was one argument and one only by which he was able to coax her into letting him make his first appearance before miss brotherton in the character of her servant and this was his very natural wish to ascertain whether edward and fanny would recognize him it was therefore still in the dress and with the demeanour of a servant that the poor factory boy now become a tall and very handsome young man armed himself with courage to enter the presence of his brother and once more to draw near to the dear and gentle little being whom he had so fondly loved during the miserable period they had passed together at the deep valley it had been previously agreed between himself and martha that when she sent for him it should be for the purpose of giving him some long and particular instructions respecting the luggage he was to get from the custom-house in order to give him time to look and be looked at before the moment of discovery should arrive the young man trembled like an aspen leaf as he laid his hand upon the lock of the door the opening of which would bring him face to face with his brother and perchance he might have indulged in a longer interval of preparation had not the voice of martha distinctly pronounced the words come in further delay was out of the question he pushed forward the door and entered the first figure that his eyes fell upon was that of a young lady 
small and of very delicate proportions whose head which was hanging over some employment as the door opened was raised as he entered displaying to him a very lovely face and a pair of eyes whose dark brilliance almost made the beholder wink could that be fanny fletcher no yet that it should be miss brotherton seemed more impossible still like all young people who have been separated from some one considerably older than themselves ever since the period when this difference made one of them appear fully grown while the other was still a child michael fancied that in miss brotherton he should see an elderly person no more like a pretty girl than he was himself but mary brotherton had not fully completed her twenty-ninth year and happening moreover to be very peculiarly young-looking both in face and figure it was not very wonderful that he should doubt of her identity but it was in truth mary brotherton and no other whose bright and laughing loveliness made him turn his admiring eyes away in search of something dearer though not more beautiful at the end of the sofa-table at which miss brotherton sat with martha dowling beside her was a young female figure which presented only a profile to his gaze but that was enough the delicate oval face the sweet regular small features the glossy light brown hair parted madonna-like upon the ivory brow and the long eyelash that seemed to rest upon her cheek as she read all proclaimed that he looked upon the same gentle lovely creature whose soft voice had whispered patience when his spirit but for her had died within him at the sight of this sweet vision that in shadowy and uncertain outline had so often visited his reveries michael's manhood almost forsook him and large tears gathered in his eyes which he was fain to hide by turning round again and performing some blundering operation with the lock of the door martha played her part admirably appearing to be the most exceedingly particular young lady about boxes bags and desks that ever travelled remember i beg she said that you see yourself to the opening of every package don't let them touch a single article that you do not watch the whole time and be sure that everything is locked again and on no account forget the covers or mismatch them and remember particularly etc etc and so she ran on at the imminent risk of being classed by her clever friend mary as the veriest fidget that ever arrived to bore a peaceful household and all in order to give her poor companion time to recover himself and see distinctly what was before him but michael could not recover himself nor could he even find courage to look about him it was a large saloon that miss brotherton occupied and the agitated young man rather felt that there was a gentleman occupied with books and papers at a distant table than saw him yet to see him he was determined if his life were to be the forfeit and turning his head with an eye as troubled as that of hamlet when tremblingly following his father's spirit he stood at last with clasped hands protruded head and features almost convulsed with emotion when he had an uninterrupted view of his brother's calm and beautiful countenance edward was very busily employed and unconsciously submitted himself to this examination without raising his eyes or moving in any way but miss brotherton's ear caught something like a sob from the silent object of all martha's eloquence and suddenly looking up perceived michael in the attitude described but stealthily and perhaps unknowingly approaching edward's table while the tears he could no longer check rolled down his manly cheek there are some individuals of the human family gifted with such quickness of perception and rapidity of inference that their faculties act with the certainty of instinct and the brilliancy of inspiration miss brotherton was one of those and after looking for a minute or two at michael quite as earnestly as michael looked at edward she sprung from the sofa pushed the table that stood before it with such violence from her as nearly to overset it and rushing forward laid her hand upon his arm exclaiming for mercy's sake tell me young man who you are and where you come from on hearing these words in a voice unusually loud and agitated edward rose hastily from his seat and approached miss brotherton as to protect her from some threatened danger but turning towards him she held up her hand as if to prevent his hostile approach and said stay edward stay look at him good heaven look at him dearest edward and tell me who he is like thus addressed edward did look at his brother and for a moment with a countenance that seemed to say miss brotherton had lost her wits but suddenly michael smiled at him as he caught his puzzled eye and then he started and almost gasped for breath and his distracted eyes fixed themselves on the agitated face before him as if they would read in it the history of years edward teddy cried michael opening his arms and making a step in advance 
in the next instant the brothers were locked in each other's arms and miss brotherton drew back and gazed upon them from a distance as if the very ground that sustained hearts under the influence of such feelings was holy while fanny fletcher rose and sat down and rose again checking the feeling that would have sent her to stretch forth a hand of welcome to her old friend by telling herself that no hand no voice but edward's could be cared for then and perhaps she was right for it is certain that for several minutes neither edward nor michael were fully conscious where they were nor who they might be that were near them once and again each beating heart was strained against the brother heart and then their right hands clasped and the left placed each on the other's shoulder Quote, they fell to such perusal of the face that now after eight cruel years of absence was once more beaming with love and sympathy before their eyes that it must have been a very heartless and soulless being who should have come between them though such a history as michael's might well have occupied more than one long summer's day in the telling to ears so greedy of every circumstance connected with it as were those of edward yet it is wonderful how very short a time sufficed to point out the keystone of the arch upon which the whole wonderful fabric hung and then it was that fanny fletcher's voice was heard exclaiming in a burst of uncontrollable emotion then it was i that caused it all oh miss brotherton it was i who kept him in that horrid place for years had i not told you he was dead it would have been he who would have been the happy object of your bounty instead of me oh how can he ever forgive me this was uttered with such agitated rapidity that though there was more than one present who would have been ready enough to contradict the self-accusing statement she gave them no time for it but it sufficed to draw michael from the side of his brother and to place him at hers and though this terrible thought drew a shower of tears from fanny's eyes notwithstanding the exceeding happiness which was at the very same moment throbbing at her heart it may be that there could not have been found a more effectual mode of at once bringing back the long-parted friends to the same tone of familiar intercourse in which they had parted as this sincere self-recrimination on one part and the warm pleading against its injustice on the other for some minutes this lasted without being interrupted by a word from any one for both mary and edward found sufficient occupation in looking at them both and then exchanging expressive glances of thanksgiving and happiness with each other but at length upon fanny's saying with a fresh burst of tears oh michael michael your eloquence is all in vain you will never never teach me to forget that i have been enjoying the blessed destiny intended for you and that by means of words uttered by myself upon her saying this the happy mary brotherton pushed a low tabouret before the reunited friends and seating herself upon it took fanny's hand in hers and said if you would not cry about it my fanny i should think it was a mighty pretty exhibition of true feeling and false argument that we were witnessing but if you really intend to be unhappy we shall all range ourselves immediately on michael's side and laugh you to scorn for your sophistry and the deplorable confusion you are making between cause and effect i should like to know little lady how much it would have profited our michael had you refused to answer when i inquired at the deep valley factory if you knew aught about him had you while firmly believing he was dead declined to state your belief lest you might be mistaken what would it have availed him darling could he have crept down before us from his sick-bed to settle the question no dear casuist you know better your looks are much more wise than your words fanny for even now though you pretend to shake your head your tooth-telling eyes confess that you have not yet another syllable to say but is it not singular said martha who had been contemplating the scene with unspeakable delight is it not singular that michael should twice have been the victim of words uttered by such very friendly lips singular dear martha replied mary is not every event connected with a hero of romance of necessity and by immutable prescription singular and whom did fate and fortune ever fix upon more unmistakably to fill that distinguished position in society than michael armstrong why are we all here together wholly and solely because michael armstrong saved lady clarissa shrimpton from the terrors inspired by a cow is it not so dear friends can any of you deny that all the exceeding happiness that blesses us at this moment has arisen from that most marvellously silly adventure and shall we any of us quarrel at the steps though some of them it must be confessed were rough enough which have led from that nonsensical beginning to an end that has made us all so very happy yes michael armstrong is a hero he is our hero 
he is the crowning blessing that is come to make us all thank heaven for having brought us every one from greater and less degrees of misery to very perfect happiness and shall we not welcome him with smiles instead of tears fanny nothing could have been more admirably suited to the effect which the happy heiress meant to produce than these words how after this could michael shrink as he had expected to do from the humiliating comparison between edward and fanny with himself or how could fanny persist in weeping when her own heart as well as those of all around her was so cheeringly called upon to rejoice nothing of the sort was any longer thought of by either without very well knowing how it came about michael of all the multitude of contending feelings which had been lately so cruelly assailing him being as they were of that most harassing race begotten between fear and hope was now conscious of only hope and that one was happiness unmixed his frank and generous nature could no longer harbour any doubts as to the place he held in the affections of those whom he had lately thought of as almost too high and too happy to remember him he was with them he was of them if a thought of the future glanced athwart the delicious present it came accompanied by a buoyant consciousness that there was that within him which would enable him to redeem lost time and that whatever those who loved wished him to be that he should have power to become nor was an answering confidence wanting in those who wearied not of gazing at his bright expressive features and his noble form fanny thought that he was exactly everything she would have dreamed he must be had she ventured to dream that he existed at all mary thought that she read capacity which promised power to become all that edward could wish him to be and she was not disposed to wish for more and edward himself thought and felt that had he power to choose a brother from among all the nations of the earth and the noblest of them michael would have been the one he would have selected and where is my dear good tremlett said miss brotherton in the midst of all this rare felicity she must not be left out she has shared our mourning for your loss dear michael and shame it were she should not share our joy at finding you shall i go and call her hither cried fanny rising no that you shall not fanny replied miss brotherton i will not trust you it was i who dragged the dear good soul from post to pillar in order to find you michael it was i who never let her know rest night or day because you were not and who but i shall bring her the glad tidings of your restoration but truly delighted as was mary brotherton at the idea of the pleasure which she well knew this unlooked-for arrival would cause her old friend she would not let her taste it without the addition of a little mystification and accordingly she led her into the room which contained the happy party with no other preparation than telling her that there was a young englishman in the saloon to whom she must come and be introduced because he was a countryman to this the tractable old lady agreed without testifying any very lively emotion but when she had got into the midst of the group and witnessed the general exaltation of spirits which seemed to possess them all after looking and listening for a little while she could not help whispering to fanny do you know my dear who that young man is i never saw miss brotherton no nor mr armstrong either seem to be so extraordinarily intimate with any one before just at first sight in reply to this fanny only hid her face and laughed for she dared not trust her voice to give the information required how very odd murmured the old lady drawing her knitting from her bag it is very odd mrs tremlett very odd indeed said mary there is no denying it but the fact is that mr armstrong has taken such an extraordinary fancy to this young man that i really think i shall be obliged to ask him to live with us there will be plenty of room you know in my rhenish castle the old lady said not a word in reply but she looked puzzled and vexed and shook her head as much as to say that it was not like her young mistress to talk such nonsense as that so in her own defence mary was obliged to explain the mystery and as happy an old woman was nurse tremlett as she looked and listened as ever tasted joy from the contemplation of it in others End of chapter thirty two Chapter Thirty Three of the Life and Adventures of Michael Armstrong. This is a LibriVox recording. Chapter Thirty Three, a tete a tete, a second, a third, a mysterious result, conclusion. Delightful as was this state of mind to all that shared it, it could not last. Michael was too much in earnest in his dread of being a burden upon Miss Brotherton to permit many days to pass before he begged her to let him converse with her for a few moments in private 
and mary who had already seen quite enough to convince her that the affection which michael and fanny had conceived for each other amidst the dreary misery of the deep valley mill was not likely to be forgotten in the gay happiness of nice fully anticipated an humble confession on the part of michael that he could not be happy without her permission to become the acknowledged lover of her charming friend and protege and very amiable frank and noble-minded did she consider it in him thus openly to avow the truth at once but nothing could be further from the thoughts of michael than making any such confession as this which it may be observed is by no means saying that his heart was either innocent or unconscious of the presumptuous passion she attributed to it greatly however did miss brotherton underrate the young man's character when she conceived that the gracious favour with which she had received him could generate in his heart a wish to ask for more it is taking a great liberty madam began michael if you love me do not call me madam my dear michael she replied do you not perceive that edward and fanny both call me mary until i had taught them to do so i never could feel that they quite understood the true spirit of my attachment towards them or the mode and manner of existence which i have imagined for myself and which must have fallen to the ground if i had found them incapable of being to me or letting me be to them all that i wished and desired you must not dearest michael come and shake this perfect and delightful union introducing forms and ceremonies foreign to our manners and our feelings pray do not look so grave dear friend promise to offend thus no more and i will cease to scold you dearest miss brotherton said michael but this did not satisfy the exigeante lady who shook her head and held up her finger in reproof dearest mary then he resumed colouring brightly and with a smile that made her think she could trace a family likeness to edward the greatest wish i have on earth is to become such as you might approve and if i shrink from the dear and precious familiarity which must make edward and fanny so happy think not that i am incapable of loving you as perfectly as they do but remember dearest lady that however humble their origin the very circumstance of their having been your honoured companion for years is of itself sufficient to raise them to such a tone of thinking and of manners as may in some sort justify their using the privilege you so graciously afford but alas you must know too well that the case is far different with me the overflowing joy of our first meeting naturally broke down as it were all inequalities all boundaries and i certainly felt and perhaps spoke as if i too were one of the accomplished little circle that might call this earthly paradise their home but reflection will come most generous mary if not amidst the happy intoxicating moments of the day it will make itself a voice in the quiet reasoning meditations of the night and so loudly has this voice been heard by me that i cannot no in spite of all the happiness that surrounds me i cannot live on thus an idle ignorant dependent on your bounty the heiress was half vexed but more than half pleased by this trembling address the deep sincerity of which was testified by the working features of a countenance more than commonly expressive of all that passed within she had enjoyed so much genuine happiness since the arrival of michael and had watched with pleasure so exquisite the happiness of edward and fanny that she almost trembled at the idea of any change yet she knew the boy was right she knew that he ought to apply himself immediately and strenuously to such studies as were most necessary for the redeeming the time he had lost and so well aware was she of this that notwithstanding her unwillingness to part with him she rejoiced heartily to find that she was wrong as to the subject on which she had suspected he wished to speak had she been right in her conjecture all she could have done would have been to endow the boy and girl with such a portion of her wealth as might have sufficed to make them independent but under such circumstances all notion of essential improvement must of course be abandoned for ever and for many reasons this would have been a source of lasting regret to her it was therefore with cordial approbation that after the interval of a few minutes she replied michael you are right nature has done so much for you my dear friend that our wish to keep you constantly with us might easily had you shown less courage have tempted us to fancy that you wanted nothing which you have not got or which we could not give you but you are quite right in refusing to consent to this we will immediately return to germany where you shall be placed at the same admirable institution that so rapidly made your brother what you now see him two years of well-directed devotion to study my dear michael will perhaps make you feel more at your ease among us though i doubt if it can produce any change which will make us love you better miss brotherton dearest miss brotherton exclaimed michael 
while perhaps the brightest beam of hope that ever yet shot from his eyes met hers as she affectionately gazed upon him that was not what i what i dared venture to hope and ask for what you now propose would be a happiness the idea of which i think i should have turned from even in my dreams from shame at its towering ambition all i meant to ask was your kind aid to place me in some business where i might earn a maintenance that in a year or two might prevent my being a burden to you and now and now michael i tell you fairly that i have not the slightest intention of doing any such thing besides my own particular objection to such a mode of proceeding i have lately heard a little anecdote of you from your friend martha which makes it very doubtful whether you deserve that species of independence for she put it in your possession once you know and you could not keep it i shall manage better michael depend upon it one week more of idleness in this sweet spot and then we travel back to germany you shall not be left to study in a more forsaken condition than was your brother we shall be within an easy distance of you my dear michael one corner of my castle must hold us while another is beautified and it is likely enough the work will go on all the better for our being there and your visit to rome given up for my sake cried michael oh no 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 most certainly replied mary laughing i would not give up that journey michael for more than i will say Quote, all is not lost that is delayed instead of giving up the plan i only mean to improve it tell me and tell me honestly dear michael do you not think in your heart that we shall one and all enjoy this journey more if you are with us mary exclaimed the boy wholly overcome and seizing and kissing her hand with an emotion that at once and for ever banished all reserve mary it is your will to be loved and who can disobey but my happiness seems greater than i can bear where is edward let me walk and talk with him he is used to you mary and all this may not seem to him so very much like a dream as it does to me if he tells me it is all real i shall believe it and with these words and his fine face glowing with all the best and happiest feelings of our nature michael bounded from the presence of his benefactress to seek his brother i might have lived a good while in my fine house at milford and received a prodigious number of complimentary visits from my elegant neighbours before i should have enjoyed half an hour as i have done this thought the happy mary brotherton as she strolled out through an open window that led to a little garden of orange trees how delicious is the air this morning but where was the climate where at that moment she would have felt it to be otherwise michael had no difficulty in finding his brother who in truth was lingering near on purpose to question him after this interview come with me edward cried the agitated boy seizing his arm here are our hats come with me into that little grove yonder my heart will burst if i do not instantly tell you what has passed and arm in arm they crossed the road and a small enclosure opposite and there found themselves under the shelter of a little wood thick enough to exclude the peering eyes of mortals as well as that of the sun notwithstanding their eagerness for the communication which was to follow and which was pretty equally strong in both not a word was uttered by either till they reached this covert and then michael throwing himself upon a bank and casting his hat away clasped his hands and raising his eyes to heaven exclaimed edward she is an angel edward had not followed his brother's example in lying down but stood before him in act to listen but there was something in these words that seemed to shake him for he turned away without answering has she ever named to you her plans about me resumed michael yes replied edward then you know that it is not her intention to assist me by enabling me to learn any trade in handicraft no such idea michael ever entered her head said edward gravely but my dear fellow you seem to take all this so very coolly do you know that it is her intention to send me to the same place where your education was completed do you know that she gives up no that she postpones her journey to italy till i am ready to go with her edward do you know all this my dear brother replied edward i only know that from the moment she learnt you were alive she determined that she would immediately make you perfectly independent as she has done me all the rest i think depended upon your own inclination and had she not found you disposed for this scheme she would not have insisted upon it disposed for it edward oh what cold what chilling words you could not speak so if you thought there were any hope of my so profiting by it as to become a fit companion for you for her for fanny but it is too late 
you feel that it is too late is it not so edward no michael no returned edward with sudden animation with your faculties your eager desire to learn and the masters you will have to put you in the way of doing so i know that the result of these two years of study will be all you wish and all your friends can desire then how can you receive this glorious news my edward so composedly first dear michael because it is no news to me and secondly because i am a selfish wretch and was thinking perhaps more of my own interest than of yours forgive me for it my own dear michael but i would rather have it decided that we should have both marched off and taken service under the emperor of austria i know that commissions would have been obtained for us michael as his brother uttered these words looked up into his face with an expression of such astonishment and dismay that the blood rushed to edward's face and he turned away to conceal his confusion edward you are a mystery to me exclaimed michael springing upon his feet and taking his brother by the arm can it be possible that you are weary of the life you lead oh heaven and such a life weary i am weary of it michael weary of rising every day to feel that i am a wretch unworthy to breathe the breath of life anywhere and oh how utterly unworthy to breathe it here it was now poor michael's turn to change colour and he did so pretty violently for first he became very red and then exceedingly pale that edward such as he had ever remembered him such as he found him now that he should so very solemnly declare himself to be a wretch unworthy of life was a horror and a misery as terrible as it was unexpected he had no power to utter any soothing in contradiction to this appalling statement for alas it might be true and michael's heart sunk within him as he remembered how totally ignorant he was of everything that might enable him to disbelieve it silently the brothers walked on for some paces side by side they were both of them either unwilling or unable to speak at length a sort of shuddering emotion that passed through michael's frame made it itself felt by the arm of edward which he still held and then he stopped and without raising his eyes from the ground said michael how is it you understand me do you suppose that i have been guilty of some criminal act such as dooms man to the gallows if not why do you shudder thus would you not shudder edward if you heard me say that i was a wretch unworthy to live poor michael perhaps i might but still i doubt if i should understand the phrase as you do it is so difficult so impossible to express temperately and soberly my own reprobation of the feelings that destroy me and yet dear michael he continued more tranquilly i could have fancied that there was something working in your own heart which might have taught you in some degree to guess the state of mine i have no strength no courage to enter on the guilty subject fully but that you may not think me a felon michael i will tell you in one audacious word i love and that with a fervour a vehemence of passion that often makes me tremble at myself for did it ever master me so far as to force a confession of it in the presence of its object i never could look up again but must and would for ever become an alien from all i love and a friendless wanderer on the face of the earth though shocked more deeply than he had any wish or power to express michael could not resist the belief which came with terrible strength upon him that his unhappy brother had conceived a passion for some married woman and that his best chance of recovering both his virtue and his tranquillity would be by following the wish he had expressed and by entering on a new and active career to give himself a chance of obliterating from his mind the feelings which had so unhappily taken possession of it such a destination for edward must of course destroy some of the very brightest of his own beautiful day-dreams but there was a fund of integrity and real goodness in the heart of michael that permitted him not at that moment to think of himself edward said he solemnly if this be so follow the course that your better feelings have suggested adopt at once the profession of a soldier it has ever been accounted a noble one though under happier circumstances but that matters not if your passions have led you wrong let your principles bring you back again confess the truth to your generous benefactress at once michael replied edward looking into his face with an expression of suffering that almost amounted to agony i would rather die first these words seemed intended to close the conversation or at any rate they did so for the two brothers silently retraced their path to the house and a fond pressure expressive of love and pity which michael gave to the arm of edward before he parted from it was all that passed between them further at that time 
the interview of that morning with miss brotherton had awakened in the mind of michael feelings towards her which an hour before he would have thought it must have taken years to produce but being equally sincere both in his former timidity and his present confidence he speedily made up his mind to open his heart to her and do for his guilty but suffering brother what it was evident he had not courage to do for himself in pursuance of this resolution he again sought the heiress and whispered in her ear mary will you let me talk to you a little more she eagerly complied with the implied invitation and passing her arm through his accompanied him to the scene of their former tete-a-tete -tete. there was no shyness on the part of michael the familiar appellation he had used was not assumed for the purpose of proving his obedience but resulted from a genuine feeling of affectionate confidence in every word she had uttered and which had left on his mind the belief that she was not only his generous patroness but his loving friend i little thought when i was talking to you this morning about my poor self he said that i should so soon have to take you away again from your drawing to talk about edward about edward said mary colouring what do you wish to say about him dear michael it is something that he declares he would die rather than say to you himself replied michael but i am certain that you ought to know it for it is quite clear that there is no chance of happiness for him unless you agree to his wishes what wishes exclaimed the heiress terribly agitated for goodness sake michael do not trifle with me did edward commission you to speak to me oh no had he felt the courage to do that i should have told him at once that he had better do it himself replied michael indeed i fear greatly that he will be displeased with me but i cannot bear to see him so miserable without mentioning it to the only person capable of helping him miserable helping him tell me michael tell me at once what you mean that is exactly what i wish to do dear mary replied michael looking with considerable surprise at her varying colour and agitated features but i fear i am doing wrong and that i have already said something that vexes you no no cried mary impatiently only go on in one word then resumed michael our dear edward wishes beyond all things to enter the austrian service and leave us returned the heiress almost gasping does edward want to leave me do not suspect him of ingratitude mary cried michael eagerly there is a reason for it and without this i am quite sure he would never think of such a thing edward has conceived an unfortunate passion for an object from whom he ought to fly and this of course will explain everything to you let me see him let me hear him from himself and from himself only i can hear this let it mean what it may on uttering these words which were spoken with a very agitated and untranquil air mary brotherton rushed out of the room much to michael's astonishment for he could by no means comprehend why she should testify such very strong emotion especially as he had so cautiously and delicately avoided hinting anything about a married woman's being unhappily the object of his brother's passion in this ignorance of michael's the reader i am very sorry to say must share there are some facts which no wise historian will ever venture to dilate upon lest their strangeness should provoke incredulity and great wisdom is shown by such forbearance for it is infinitely better than an enlightened public should be driven to exclaim how very obscure this passage is then how very improbable michael armstrong is the hero of the book that is now drawing rapidly to its conclusion and every reader has therefore a right to expect that his destiny shall be plainly announced to them whatever mystery may hang over that of others whatever occurred between the heiress and edward in the conference which they speedily held together it did not cause any alteration in that lady's purpose of immediately returning to her chateau upon the rhine a man of worth and great ability was engaged to take charge of the richly teeming eager mind of michael during the two years that it was settled he should remain at a german university and nothing could be more satisfactory than the result of this arrangement never perhaps were two years put to greater profit in the development of mind than upon this occasion and when they were ended michael armstrong was able to take his station upon the beautiful terrace without feeling that he was out of place there less than these two years had sufficed to bring to perfection all mary brotherton's plans for improving and beautifying her spacious residence it was one of those superterranean quarries which are sometimes seen to spread themselves to such miraculous extent in that region and would have inspired most ladies with a feeling of dreary vastness which notwithstanding the exceeding beauty of its position would have prevented any hope of rendering it comfortably habitable but mary had an ample heart and an ample purse 
circumstances over which to use a thoroughly authorized expression she had no control for in truth they had preceded her birth had rendered her own country less dear to her than it is to most others and she therefore not only determined to plant herself elsewhere but to do so in such a manner as would enable her to make her new abode her home in the best sense of the word and this could only be done by giving quote, ample room and verge enough to make it the home of others also any travellers lucky enough to light upon this widely spreading but comfortable and thoroughly well kept up abode will find that notwithstanding its great extent it has by no means the air of being uninhabited nobody will be much surprised to hear that michael armstrong and fanny fletcher became man and wife or that they proved a loving and very happy pair but should any curious rhenish tourist obtain an introduction to this ringhow paradise they will probably observe two very loving and happy pairs to whom it serves as a common yet in some sort a separate home each having its suite of drawing-rooms boudoirs nurseries schoolrooms etc but however much a gossiping inclination might lead to a more explicit detail there is really no room left to enter upon it all that can be said in addition to this is that when sir matthew dowling's affairs came to be wound up there was discovered to be a sufficient surplus to afford a small independence to each of his children which being divided according to the proportion dictated by the knight's will gave something approaching to a benjamin's mess portion to his daughter martha to claim and receive this as well as occasionally to visit some members of her family martha made frequent excursions to england but her happiest hours were those she passed with her dear friends in germany by whom she is ever received with open arms mrs tremlett is still enjoying an old age of perfect comfort cheered by warm affection and is already the darling of many little hearts there is no record to be found in any documents relating to the inhabitants of the chateau showing that edward armstrong ever entered the austrian service it is therefore most reasonable to suppose that this wish was never complied with end of chapter thirty three end of the life and adventures of michael armstrong the factory boy by francis milton trollope recorded by celine major